Uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So good evening and uh, welcome everyone and uh, welcome to those who have joined us for the first time today uh, in the six uh, sessions of how to be invest how to uh, be investment ready series and uh, welcome back to those who have been uh, part of our earlier sessions. Uh, how to be investment ready is a series presented by Tai Chennai and Kiritsu Forum. Uh, today is the sixth and the final session and uh, today's session is going to be on valuation and transaction documents. Uh, we started this series with uh, um, how to be startup ready, uh, followed by various stages of funding and the investor expectations. And then we had two part uh, sessions of on various aspects of fundraising and the last week's session was on uh, uh, the aspects of due diligence. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, introduce today's speaker and uh, uh, the series speaker, Mr. Subramaniam Alais uh, Subra. Uh, Subra is a forensic accountant, independent director, angel investor, strategy consultant, focusing on business models, and an expert witness with over 30 years of work experience in Asia and Australia, and transactions experience in Asia, the US, and the Europe. Subra is co-president of Kiritsu Forum, Singapore and Chennai. Kiritsu Forum is the largest angel network in the world with 53 chapters and over 3,000 accredited investors. In the entrepreneur space, over the last decade, Subra has played a missionary role in guiding and assisting CEOs of small companies in South India and Southeast Asia through critical growth stages. In India and more broadly Asia, through uh, his own ventures, Subra worked on understanding and addressing the severe shortage of uh, resources in the small business sectors from financial capital to experience capital, relationship capital and infrastructure. Subra was a partner with PricewaterhouseCoopers Singapore. In over 21 years with PwC, Subra has been an auditor and tax due diligence, and he led over 100 engagements of various sizes, including many that were cross-border for US and European multinational corporations and private equity firms. Subra qualified with um, bachelor's in accountancy honors from the NUS Singapore and thereafter with Institute of Chartered Accountants in Australia, which is now known as Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand. He also completed the general management program at Harvard Business School in the fall of 2007. On behalf of Tai Chennai and the participants here, I welcome you, sir, and invite you to take over today's session. Thank you. Thanks, Priya. Hi, SVK. I realize you just joined as well. Okay, uh, good evening. I, it's okay. okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, and uh, as uh, Priya has already introduced, this is the sixth of the six part series. Uh, so we are talking about valuations and uh, transaction documents uh, today. Uh, Priya, you're managing the slides today, no? Kapil is doing that. Kapil, no? okay. Yeah. Kapil, next slide, please. Okay, so today we will cover off deal terms and then I will go through a deal example and the relevance, uh, uh, a worked example. And the relevance of that is to understand the impact of uh, setting valuations uh, because uh, there are implications when it works and when it doesn't work, both for the investor and the entrepreneurs. So as an entrepreneur, you should also need, the need to understand the implication for the other side. Uh, then we will uh, have an introductory session on valuation methodologies, uh, and then we'll touch on deal documentation before we get to Q&A. So today is a little bit of a heavier session uh, because you need your mathematical skills to work through the examples. Um, in any case, uh, I think uh, Tai will share the slides. So. Uh, you know, if, if, if uh, it was difficult following through the talk, you can always work on it um, later on. And, and, and I've suggested to Ty that we can have a, a Q&A session on these, uh, the whole series, 
maybe two or three weeks down the road, uh, as long as it doesn't clash with uh, Tycon. Okay, next slide, couple. Uh, next one. Okay, now let me start by sensitizing you to a couple of deal terms, right? Whenever we discuss valuation, we are always discussing what's called pre-money valuation. So for example, if it's your first fundraise, right? So let's say you're about to raise funds, okay? The question is, what is your valuation? So whenever somebody asks you the valuation, they're actually asking for what's called pre-money valuation, all right? So let's say your pre-money valuation is 10 crores and you plan to raise one crore. So the post-money valuation is pre-money valuation plus the fundraise, right? That becomes post-money. Now, all other calculations are based on post money. The reason valuations always set on a pre money basis is as a startup, you don't really know how much you will raise, right? So you might say, I'm going to go and raise one crore. <clears throat> if you only raise 50 lakhs, if your pre money is 10 crores, you know, your, uh, uh, you know, uh, your, your post money is only 10.5 and, and not 11. Right? So that's the reason valuations are always calculated or, or always referred to as pre money. But when you then go and calculate your per share value, it is based on post money, right? So going back to my first example, you know, you know, pre money is 10 crores, you raise one crore, so post money is uh, 11 crores, right? Now you when you divide it by the number of shares outstanding, you get the per share value, okay? I think that's straightforward math. Now, there are a couple of other terminologies that come in because very often they would share what is the per share value on an as converted basis. Now, why as converted? Often when you raise money, uh, you will typically, uh, you might raise uh, on the basis of preference shares and on the base of a, 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 a conversion into ordinary shares uh, based on a future event. Uh, and therefore the actual number of shares that, be, that will be issued to the new investors could depend on future events, right? So there are some assumptions and, and when we go through the worked example, this will become clear to you, right? So it's not just the, the founder shares outstanding at that point in time, right? You may need to include the estimated number of shares that will be issued to the angel investors when it's all converted, right? So there is this terminology, right? The per share value based on an S converted basis, okay? Then there is something called dilution, right? Now dilution comes about normally because of share options. So you may have, uh, you know, as you raise money and you start attracting people to work for you, right? And as a startup, you may not want to pay, you know, full market value. And therefore you may incentivize people to join the company um, uh, based on uh, certain share options, right? That means as the company improves, right? Some of the options will vest into shares for your employees, right? So therefore, even after converting the investors shares, there's a further dilution to the share value that might arise from share options that you issue. Now, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't want to uh, make you experts on this uh, because we have a heavy schedule today, but I just want you to be aware that there are many different, you know, when, when, you know, when somebody talks about uh, what is the per share value, uh, you need to understand there are different parameters, right? So at least you know what questions to ask uh, and, and somebody can do the calculation for you in your particular circumstance. Right, then we should talk about the type of securities, right? Uh, usually when you form a company, it normally issues ordinary shares, right? And, and the word common stock is, uh, is a US terminology. We use shares across the Commonwealth, 
but uh, when it comes to the Americans, they use uh, stock. Okay, so it's the same. Uh, preference shares, and, and we will talk a little bit more about uh, preference shares and convertible notes. Um, the, the only real difference between preference shares is shares is actually uh, uh, equity, right? Pref shares are equity, even though it may function like a convertible note. A convertible note is actually debt, okay? Um, and in, in uh, India, we have an issue with convertible notes if it carries an interest, uh, while it's very common uh, outside India. But you know that's typical an Indian uh, uh, law problem. Uh, the Indian um, laws are a little bit ancient. Um, therefore, um, you can't issue interest uh, associated with um, pref shares or convertible notes, right? So that's why we always do CCPS, which is uh, compulsory convertible pref shares. Right, and we'll touch on some of the nuances as we get to the worked example. And then there's another terminology that you have to deal with. It's called liquidation preference. Um, and uh, I think I have a slide where I talk about, you know, different types of um, liquidation preference uh, later on. I have a slide uh, about it. Uh, what is a liquidation preference is where investors get a kind of a debt right right meaning that if the liquidation preference and, and you know this and, and you should be aware i i i, I met um, some of the founders or some of the advisors uh, to those who founded crick and fall right which they which they then sold out and the problem with the sale right that means everybody exited so it was a liquidity event and because the founders had agreed to a, a four times liquidation preference to the initial investors, uh, the initial angel investors, the angel investors made the bulk of the money. They got their Forex and only what was left was distributed to the founders, right? So the founders said that, you know, they didn't make much money. So we will touch a little bit on liquidation preference, um, you know, and, and I don't want to confuse you all about what participating and non-participating means, uh, but you have to remember liquidation preference because it can have serious implications for you at the time of exit. Uh, next slide, please, couple. Okay. And um, whenever we do deals, uh, so when it comes to the transaction documents and term sheets, there's what's called uh, anti-dilution uh, provisions. The reason there are anti-dilution rights is, let's say the angel investor invests on a pre-money value of 10 crores, you raised uh, one crore, and therefore the post-money value of the business is 11 crores. If you go and do a subsequent round, right? maybe the business is not doing well, or you're desperate for money, and you do a subsequent round, at five crores, what happens is the initial investors are losing half their shares, right? Or half their value, right? So there's usually what's called anti-dilution provision and it can be calculated on a weighted average basis or, you know, there, there's something called a ratchet and what ratchet means is if A to B, then the dilution is 5% if, or, or, or the additional shares to be issued is 5%. If the um, the you know the subsequent value is B to C, then it is ten percent more shares, right? So you can have a ratchet, or you can just have a weighted average formula. Uh, most of the transaction documents I have seen in for the investments we've done in India, uh, in India uh, that Kiritsu has done, most of it were uh, were built on a weighted average formula. Now, the, the one item that normally does not trigger an anti-dilution clause is ESOPs, which is the employee share options, right? And usually the uh, transaction documents will specifically exclude that, okay? Uh, that's just to give the company the flexibility that, you know, it needs to do what it needs, uh, what it needs to do what's required to retain and attract uh, the talent it needs to grow the business. Uh, then you need to understand dividend rights. Although um, very rarely do early stage companies pay dividends, 
Um, but you know, um, you should still be aware of it as a deal term. So there are a couple of uh, terminologies that go, uh, go with dividend rights. Uh, Non-cumulative means that you know if you uh, if you don't pay dividends in this particular year, it doesn't mean that next year you have to pay for the two years cumulatively, right? So therefore, automatically cumulative means that if it's one percent in the first year, it's one percent in the subsequent year. So when you declare, you need to pay two percent when you eventually pay it. Right, so it accumulates. Now, mandatory merely means that there is a definite requirement to pay a certain amount of dividend each year. Right, that's what mandatory means. Right now, as far as early stage companies, normally we do not impose dividend rights because you know, indeed, if you make money, if you make profits, you know, we probably want to see the profits plowed back to grow the business. In any case, most early stage companies don't have cash to pay dividends. And then that's what's called uh, protective voting rights. Uh, sometimes the terminology for it is affirmative rights. Um, basically what it does, it protects the investors from changes to the cap capital structure. What is change to the capital? If you're raising more money, you normally need the approval of the current investors right? Um, before you raise money, right? Um, if you change the board, right? Now, affirmative rights almost definitely will cover capital structure and will cover liquidity events. Board change, not always, but sometimes uh, the investors might say every time you change the board, um, they want to have a say, right? They want to say yes or no, okay? So, so some of these can work like vetoes uh, and therefore you would need to figure out how you manage these things. Um, normally uh, early stage investors are not too fussy. They like to have all of these rights in the document but they don't often exercise it right as long as you know the, the relationship doesn't break down they will not, almost always never exercise it right because they understand that early stage companies need some flexibility but at the same time, they want to make sure that they have all the legal protection that is uh, available to them under the law. Okay, Kapil, uh, next slide. Okay, deal terms. Someone has raised the hand. Um, can you all wait for questions? Unless it's Is this the one, sir? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Deal terms. What happened? Supra is offline? Ah, uh, okay. Yep, deal terms, okay. Yep. So uh, in deal terms, uh, so talking about board representation, um, Typically what happens is um, investors will secure a right to board representation, but almost rarely have I seen, um, you know, for early stage companies, right? So early investments, angels actually taking up board representation, board seats, right? Because there are fiduciary responsibilities and liabilities that arise. So normally um, what they um, ask for is board observer seats. Um, so that uh, they can be involved in the board meetings and be aware of what's going on. Uh, so we tend to prefer board observer rights as, a board, uh, as opposed to actually being appointed to the board. Um, there's uh, something called redemption rights. Um, 
and, and actually questions about this has uh, come about in uh, the earlier sessions, uh, what redemption right is, uh, the ability for uh, the entrepreneur to buy back the investor shares, right? So it can be redeemed, right? The shares can be redeemed. And of course, the question is whether both parties, uh, the company and the investor can redeem or only one party can redeem, right? So that depends on what's called call and put options. Um, and I've said here, it is rare for early stage companies because there are risks associated with, with this, right? You know, the, um, you know, if the company is not doing well and, and the investor puts the shares to you, how are you even going to buy it, right? So usually we don't have redemption rights in early stage companies, uh, but those kind of situations is often taken care of uh, using the facility of the liquidation preference. Um, there's always, uh, in, in almost every transaction that I've seen, there's always a right of first refusal. Um, and this is to allow for changes in the structure, right? So let's say you started the company with three founders, right? And one of the founders, for whatever reason, wants to quit, leave the business. Usually there will be a first of right refusal, first uh, right of first refusal, right? The shares often need to be in the first instance offered to the founder group and perhaps the early investor group. So again, the same thing, right? Uh, if the investors, uh, if one of the investors wants to leave, often those shares need to be offered to the um, rest of the early investors before it can be sold outside, right? So almost all agreements that I've seen has uh, a right of first refusal um, documentation, right? Often we refer to it as ROFR, right? ROFR. Then there is co-sale rights, right? And the way co-sale rights happens, let's say the founders decide to sell, uh, they find a buyer for some of their shares, okay? Typically there will be a tag along right, uh, meaning that the investors can tag along proportionately to let's say the founders are selling 10% of their stake. Usually the uh, investors can also sell 10% of their stake, right? That's called a tag along. Now a drag along is uh, usually comes into operations, usually after a five year period. Let's say the business is not going anywhere. It's not, uh, exits are not happening. Uh, what can happen is the investor finds a buyer, right? And the buyer would say, look, okay, I will buy it provided I, I get all the shares, in which case the investors can drag along the founders uh, and, and sell the entire company, right? So that they get an exit, right? Remember, I've, I've told you right from the start, the whole purpose of investing is so that we can get an exit in five to seven years, right? And, and normally uh, most agreements that I've seen will give uh, a window of five years uh, where uh, usually there is a clause that says that in five years you will do a sale or an IPO or something like that, right? So one, you need to breach that five year thing before uh, investors can put in their head and say, you know, do this, do that or whatever legally, right? Usually, you know, nobody waits for anything legally uh, if you build a good relationship with your investors and investors have a good relationship with the entrepreneurs, um, you know, we, we don't need to resort to the legal terminology and the rights accorded in the transaction, right? You will do the right thing that is of value to both parties, right? So uh, remember some of these things are legal, but the more important thing is uh, how do you have a good relationship that you don't need to resort to a legal uh, uh, term uh, to solve a problem. Uh, then there are something called founder terms because sometimes founders will say, well, I want to sell some of the shares along the way, right? And um, basically, you know that, you know, investors have co-sale rights and all that kind of thing. But usually sometimes you can build into the agreement itself that maybe you can sell up to, you know, three or 4% uh, of the company or 10% of the founder shareholding, something like that without triggering uh, any of the other clauses, right? So those are founder terms then, and usually there'll be things like the founders cannot start a competing business. There'll be non-competes uh, and all that sort of thing, right? So all those things are founder terms. 
And then there's something called uh, closing conditions. Um, so often, um, you know, we have come to, and, and, and I will introduce this terminology later on, and I have sort of talked about it. Um, you know, by the time they've done the due diligence, we get to what's called a term sheet, right? And the, and the due diligence may have identified that um, maybe you have patents that's uh, not fully uh, uh, registered in the name of the company. It may be in the name of one of the founders. So you may have a closing condition uh, that says, you know, the investors will put in the money once that patent is duly transferred and registered with the company, right? Because, you know, the value of the company may depend a lot on uh, the assets and the resources, right? and a patent is a resource of the company. So things like that could be closing conditions. Closing conditions can also be, you know, maybe you have uh, non-compliant um, regulatory filings, which the investors say you need to fix all that before we put in the money. So those things are called uh, closing conditions. Right. Um, there are words such as preemption clause. So there are a lot of terminology, um, legal terminology for these things, but effectively it is as I have described it. Okay, couple next slide. Okay. Now let me talk a little bit about how the valuation moves. Right. So this is a little bit of a worked example. So I'll go a little bit slower uh, and, and hope that you pick it up along the way. Now, um, as I've said, you know, there are three ways in which you can raise money. You can issue equity, which is common stock. Um, very often uh, in early stage investing, we use CCPS, which is compulsorily convertible pref shares. Um, now a convertible note works pretty much as a CCPS, except that it's a debt instrument. And typically what happens in non-Indian environments, um, people prefer to issue a convertible note because a convertible note can carry a coupon, right? A coupon is nothing but interest. Uh, the reason it's not used in India is because, um, you know, technically you can't pay an interest. Uh, according to Indian law to anyone, anyone who is not a director uh, of the company, right? So which is why we all went towards the CCPS route. But the advantage of a convertible note is that at a particular fundraise, not everybody may put in the money on the same day, right? Which is the reason, um, you know, so, so for example, you may have a round that could last a full 12 months, right? And, so, and it is a little bit unfair the person who put in the money at the start of the 12 months, at the end of the 12 months, is getting the same valuation. Okay, it happens sometimes, sometimes there's no choice. But one of the ways in which uh, uh, US startups or Singapore startups try and take care of it is by saying that there is a coupon associated with from the time that the money actually comes in. Now this coupon or interest is never paid. What happens, it accumulates, and therefore, at the time of conversion, someone who has put in the money much earlier will have a much higher balance that will then convert into uh, common stock, all right, or common shares, okay? So that's the advantage of using convertible notes. But having said that, uh, it is, I've never seen it used because we've never, we don't have the concept of coupon or interest uh, allowed under Indian law. So it always tends to be CCPS, uh, and I will talk about CCPS and I will come to the difficulties associated with CCPS, right? Um, and, and why sometimes because of that, you know, we want to do a straight equity and how we can deal with that. Okay, next slide, couple. Okay. So um, before I, I, I get into... Uh, into my worked example, um, I need to introduce you to a couple of terminology, right? So whenever there is a CCPS, right? The valuation will get triggered based on the next round of funding, right? Now the next round of funding is, is defined, right? Is defined as qualifying funding. 
and why do we define it, right? So go back to my example, right? Let's say your pre-money valuation at the angel round was 10 crores, you raised one crore. Now, if you raise another 50 lakhs later, right? A valuations that's determined on the, on the basis of a 50 lakh raise is not really fair, right? You could have a friend put in at 50 lakhs. So that often don't qualify as what's called a qualifying funding. So often we will define the quantum of qualifying funding, right? And sort of say, you know, it is qualifying funding if and only if um, you raise a total of five crores in that round or something like that. Right, or, or you define a series, right? And series is difficult. So usually it's defined on the basis of quantum of race, right? So that it's not a, you know, it's not a small race that determines the value, right? Because that's not fair, right? So the qualifying funding is often a defined term and it's a subsequent round that is kind of substantial. It's not just a, a small round. Um, then there is a, an item called valuation cap. Uh, typically, it's the value at which, um, you know, the maximum value uh, at which um, the, the, uh, the shares will convert, right? So let's say the PREF shares will convert at that valuation cap, even though your subsequent fundraise may be at a higher amount. Then there's what's called a discount. There could be a discount to a valuation cap, which is sometimes called a conversion discount. Okay. Uh, and when we looked at the worked example, you will see how they work. Now, the discount could be different. Um, so, for example, uh, if uh, the subsequent qualifying funding round is taking place in less than two years, your discount may be 20%. If it's going to take between two and three years, the discount may be 30% because it's a way of allowing for time value of money because the longer you take, right? The value of the money is different, right? Because there is a uh, time value associated with money, right? So sometimes uh, in, in many transactions, we see uh, different discount rates, right? But it gets very complicated to have more than one or two discount rates, right? Um, in in, um, in in US and Singapore deals, I've not seen uh, multiple discount rates uh, because they kind of uh, take care of it by the coupon associated with the convertible debt, right? But in India, because we can't do the coupon, uh, we often um, take care of the, if you like the interest element or the time value of money element using differential discount rates, right? So it's just a, a complication because of the laws in India, right? And then of course, the big issue is, what if there's no next round, right? You're not able to raise uh, another round of funds. And this is where uh, liquidation preference comes into the scene. And I have a, a slide on liquidation preference. So I would talk about it at that time, right? So, you know, the question is, what is the value, right? And that gets a little bit complicated. Right, so I'll talk about it in my liquidation preference slide. Okay, but the terms that you need to think of, qualifying funding, valuation cap, discounts, and then let's get into our examples. Okay, next slide, Kapil. Okay. You all need to be paying attention to the slide and maybe even have a piece of paper, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I think in, uh, in millions, so I, I've used millions. I mean, you can convert it into crores, right? So let's say you're doing an angel round, right? So deal A, you're doing an angel round and you are raising 20 million uh, rupees, right? Which is about two crores. And the valuation cap, let's say, is uh, 20 crores, right? Or 200 million, okay? And the discount, remember I, I talked to a discount, right? So the discount applies to the next round valuation. It also applies to the cap, right? So the valuation cap is uh, 200 million. If the 30% applies to the cap, 
um, at the next round, the valuation cap is equally adjusted downwards, right? And this is sometimes called a conversion discount. And let's say this uh, terms apply for a 24 month period. And of course you have an issue if it doesn't get a 24 month is a different issue. But let's say, you know, the, the next round happens. Uh, and I think I've worked out the IRRs uh, based on a 21 month uh, period on which the next round happens. Right now in the next round, right? Let's say in the series A round, the pre-money valuation of the qualifying funding, right? And this is why the qualifying funding is important. Say the pre-money valuation of the qualifying round is 500 million or 50 crores. And the amount you raise is 10 million or 10 crores, right? So 10 crores, people would say, yeah, you know, it, it, it is a qualifying funding, right? Given that you only raised two crores in the first round, 10 crores, five times what you raise seems to make sense, okay? So these are the terms of the deal. So now what happens, right? The subsequent round is at 50 crores and the valuation cap is 20 crores, which means your valuation cap will apply, right? The discount is not on the 50 crores, but on the 20 crores, right? So what is the ownership for the angels? So the ownership for the angels, right? Based on the um, two crores that they put in on the basis of a, a 20 crore pre-money valuation, it's 12.5%, right? There's a discount that applies. Uh, there's a 30% discount to the 20 crores and therefore you get 12.5%. And that is of course, before the dilution. Why is there a dilution? There's a dilution because the new investor is putting 10 crores on a 50 crore valuation, right? So it's 10 crores over 60 crores and therefore it's one sixth. So the dilution to the original angel investors is one sixth, right? Or 16.7%. So the 12.5% actually becomes 10.4%. Okay. Now what is the value to the investor? The value of the stake is therefore 10.4% of the post money valuation after the qualifying round, right? And the post money valuation is 600 million, right? The value pre-money is uh, 500 followed by a uh, 100 million. So the value of the stake to the angel investor is 62.4 million. Now, what did they put in? They put in 20 million, right? So they have a notional return of 212%. And if this had happened 21 months uh, after the investment, the IRR is pretty good. It's 92%, right? Right, and they can jump for joy, right? It's not often we get a 92% IRR, right? It's extremely rare, but I just, uh, I'm showing it to say that, uh, to show the impact of having a discount that applies to the cap, okay? Now, um, I hope you guys have followed it, but you know, we can go back to it at the questions, but let me just kind of go with the flow uh, for the time being. So couple, next slide. Okay, now to show you what happens if the discount does not apply to the cap, meaning there's no conversion discount, okay? All other aspects of the deal are exactly the same. So what happens? The ownership for the angel investor is, right, is based on 200 million or 20 crores and not 70% of 200 million. Therefore, the original shares is only 9.1%. The diluted equity interest is calculated exactly the same way we did in the previous slide and is therefore 7.5%. And therefore, the value of the stake is 45 million, right? 7.5% of 600 million, which is post money after the next round. Now the notional return goes down considerably for the angel investor, right? They had a 212% return. This time they have a only a 125% return, right? But if this happens in 21 months, the IRR at 59 is not that bad, okay? Um, no, no investor will complain about a 59% IRR, right? So this explains to you the impact of the valuation cap 
or, or the impact of a conversion discount, right? Having a conversion discount and not having a conversion discount makes a huge difference in terms of returns to the angel investor. So my point is, even when you do a CCPS, it doesn't mean that you will not have a discussion about valuation, right? Because what you know today or what you're learning today, an experienced angel investor also knows, right? And therefore, uh, the issue of valuation becomes important even when you think that you're pushing off the valuation to a subsequent qualifying funding event, okay? So that's the point I want to raise and, and I will emphasize it again uh, once I've gone through it. Now, these two slides were actually a happy situation, meaning that your subsequent round was at a valuation um, higher than the cap, right? Your cap is at uh, 200 million. The uh, qualifying funding valuation was 500 million, right? So we will look at the next slide where your subsequent round was at a lower valuation and we want to know what the implication of it is. The next slide, couple. Right. So I've called this deal B, okay? And, and it, you know, and, and given that your subsequent value qualifying funding, right? If you look at the fifth bullet on the left-hand side, right? Your pre-money valuation of the subsequent round is at 180 million, right? Or 18 crores, right? And the amount raised is uh, five crores, okay? So it is below the valuation cap. So when it is below the valuation cap, the initial investor will not convert at the valuation cap, right? The discount will apply, okay? So the ownership will actually convert at 180 million, right? Which is therefore uh, the angel investors get 13.7%, okay? Now the dilution is significant. You're raising 50 million on 180. So 50 divided by 230 is 21.7%, right? So when you have down rounds like this, right? Or when you have subsequent rounds at a value below the valuation cap, the dilution both for the founders, and I will talk about the dilution to the founders in the next slide, but the dilution to the angel investors is a lot more significant, right? And therefore the diluted equity interest is 10.7%, but more importantly, the value of the stake is so low giving only a notional return of 23%, right? And where is 23% compared to the 212% that I talked about earlier, as well as the 125% that I talked earlier, because all other aspects of the deal are the same, okay? So this is, so now bear this in mind. Now, let me look at what this means to the founders, okay? Which is the next slide. So couple, next slide. Now, as I said, deal A and deal B is exactly the same, right? The only implications on deal, the two deal A's was whether there was a conversion discount or not, right? So the numbers in the brackets are where there was no conversion discount, okay? Now, what happens when you when the valuation, when you do a subsequent round at below the valuation cap, you find that the founders end up with much lower shareholdings. The angels do end up with higher shareholdings, but as I showed the calculation earlier, their value is much less, their appreciation is much less, right? So who gets more? You find that the, the subsequent round investor, right? The venture capital or the series A investor gets more of the company, right? Now, this is why the valuation cap is important, right? So as an angel, if I find the valuation cap ridiculously high, I will tell the founder, it's not a deal for me, not so much because I can't be compensated, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I can still make a return, right? I can get a discount, uh, we can figure out the numbers, but the concern for the angel investor is the dilution of the founders, okay? I was looking for a graph and, and the worst you do below the valuation cap, you will find that the founder shares keep dropping a lot more. Angels will 
get uh, higher because uh, that's how the discounts apply and that's how the conversion applies, right? Because you get a discount on the next round valuation. <clears throat> but the founder's stake in the business will reduce drastically, right? And, and as I mentioned in, I think my very first session, one of the concerns for angels is founders losing interest in the business, right? Because then who's going to run the business, right? Um, because angels don't, that's not their business, right? They, their business is investing. So they rely on angels to continue to be interested enough to run the business. So which is why um, even the valuation cap is of huge concern, right? So you can expect a significant debate around valuation caps, even if you try to do a CCPS, okay? Because there is implications for how they would dilute, there is implications for returns for the angels. And, and there is huge implications for the founders in terms of how much of the company you own after the qualifying round, okay? So this is uh, why there is usually a serious discussion uh, around valuations because it's got uh, 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 a lot of implications. Um, okay, uh, next slide, couple. Okay. Right. So let me summarize the observations from all of those uh, calculations, right? So the higher the subsequent round valuation compared to the valuation cap, the better the return for the angels, despite a lower stake in the company, right? If you remember my first deal A, the angels were getting 212% or 125%, even though their stake is much lower than if you raise the next round at below valuation cap, right? So actually, you know, by and large, um, angels hope that you will do the next round at a much higher valuation, right? Which is why you come with a very high valuation cap. Angels would say, no, nope, that's not going to work for me, right? Because they know this. They know that their value is determined by your ability to raise the next round at a higher valuation. Down valuations hurt us, okay? Um, and high valuations, higher uh, high valuation caps that fail in the next round. What do I mean by fail? That means you're not able to raise at a valuation cap. And if it's more and more below the valuation cap, your founder interest becomes less and less, which is a huge concern for angel investors, right? Because I don't want founders to lose interest in the business, right? Then you find that the business goes nowhere and we need a liquidity event and then apply liquidation interest, okay? So even if you're doing a convertible note, right? Whether you're doing a convertible press shares or a convertible note without a coupon in the case of India, uh, remember that valuation is still an important discussion, right? Because it has implications, right? And the purpose of those workings is to show you what the implications uh, will be. Okay, next slide, Kapil. So sometimes what happens is angels get sick and tired of having this debate about valuation caps, okay? So one of the ways in which we have avoided valuation cap discussions is by linking the, the valuation at which uh, our investment converts uh, to revenue, okay? So you know, sometimes when we have these huge debates about the valuation cap, right? And the reason we have those debates is because of the implications that uh, I just demonstrated to you with the worked example. So sometimes we often have um, very confident uh, entrepreneurs who come and say, look, you know, uh, you should give us a much higher valuation because, um, you know, we, we, we're going to do three crores of sales, right? We're going to do five crores of sales, okay? So we have often done this. Uh, we have done what's called a conditional uh, valuation and the valuation that's linked to revenue, right? So if they are so confident, we'd say, okay, if post-close, that means after close, the forward 12 months, 
if you raise, uh, if your revenue is more than three crores, we will give you a pre-money value of 16 crores, okay? If your revenue is between one and three crores, we will give you a pre-money value of 14 crores. And if it's less than one crore, we will say, okay, we'll give you a pre-money value of 12 crores. Now, it, it is a way of making the uh, entrepreneurs happy because they say, oh, you know, if I, because they, they, they make the argument that uh, they will do very well and therefore they're entitled to a higher valuation, right? And I can tell you from experience, almost none of them, none of them will even hit one crore in the first year, right? So some of this is, uh, this is a bit of a psychological game um, because it is simply not easy um, to convert from, and, 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 and this is uh, something that happens a lot for Keretsu because we do a lot of investments that is very early. That means they're often pre-revenue. There's proof of concept, early stage of com commercial, uh, commercialization, maybe only um, one or two sales at the time of the investment. And therefore, when it's so early and, and, and entrepreneurs demand high valuations, it is actually a very difficult conversation, right? So my, my only point to y'all is there is a reason. I mean, if the angel investor is sophisticated, there is a reason um, uh, they discuss valuation at some length, right? And if you can't bridge that valuation, there is no point going forward, right? So valuation is an important consideration. Um, and, you know, we will get a little later into how we, we assess uh, these valuations, right? Because with early stage companies, there's really no track record on which we can build a financial model. Okay. So it is a lot of guesswork and I will get into some of that guesswork in a moment. Okay. Next slide, couple liquidation preference. Okay, right, uh, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned this term liquidation preference a few times, and it's a very important deal term, right? So the first question, when is it triggered? It is typically triggered when the business goes nowhere, right? So it can be triggered if the business goes nowhere, but maybe the business has some assets like uh, intellectual property or, or something that can be sold off, right? Some asset within that can be sold off. So that's a liquidation event. Or the founders say, look, you know, we can't really take this business anywhere. Um, let's sell it. Okay. So that means all the founders are exiting, right? So when that happens, that's also a, a liquidation uh, event. Okay. Now, if you're exiting at a time when the business has grown um, phenomenally and you're taking it IPO or you're getting damn good value, no angel investor will trigger liquidation preference because they get much less than the exit value if they convert it to uh, equity, okay? So liquidation preference is an event that uh, is triggered uh, by a liquidity event that is not achieving the value anticipated, right? It's not giving the 5X return. It's not even giving 3X return, right? So what happens is there's usually a liquidation preference uh, and the liquidation preference can be a participating or non-participating. If it's participating, let's say the liquidation preference is 2x, right? If the liquidation preference is 2x, it means that when you sell whatever's left in the company, uh, and if the investors have invested one crore, right, they get the two first two crores, right, before it is available to the founders uh, and others, okay? So, and if it's participating, they will get 2x plus their proportionate share of the remainder, okay? If it's non-participating, the investor only gets the 2x and nothing more. All the rest goes to, um, to the uh, founders, okay? Uh, typically, what I have seen uh, in uh, most of the agreements we have done, uh, liquidation preference tend to be non-participating so that it's not confusing. And usually it's something like uh, one times or 1.5 times, right? One times basically gives the angel investors nothing. It's just protection of capital. Um, but that's on the assumption that liquidation preference is actually the 
undesirable event, right? Nothing happens. So um, we, have, uh, we have agreed to between one and 1.5 times. All right, in the old days when uh, entrepreneurs were not so aware, uh, as I told you, the Crick Info deal, I think the founders or the advisors to the founders told me they agreed to a four times uh, liquidation preference. So when they sold it, um, the investors got most of the money and the founders got very little. Okay, so the, the one time, two times, 1.5 times is what we call the liquidation multiple. Okay, sometimes there's a cap uh, participation, meaning that uh, um, maybe there's an amount to which the investors can participate, but the amount is capped. Okay. But the most important thing to understand about liquidation preference is when it is triggered, right? This is usually not, not our preferred exit, right? We would actually like to build a business and, and exit at uh, 5x or 10x or, or more, right? But a liquidation preference is a downside protection for the investors, right? So basically it has a debt feature, right? So for example, if I have 1.5 times liquidation preference, it means that you know, for a one crore investment, at least the investors get 1.5 times, right? It, so liquidation preference is a debt feature introduced into an equity investment, right? Which is what uh, PREF shares are. Okay, next slide, couple. Right. Now with early stage investments, um, uh, there are a few other things uh, that is important to uh, investors. One is right to information. Um, we want to know, um, have information on a regular basis, whether quarterly or six months. So often these things, uh, uh, get drafted into the term sheets and the definitive agreements, right? So right of information is important. Y you know, uh, as I said earlier, very often we don't want to be directors because that comes with other fiduciary responsibilities, but we want to have information about how the business is going, how is it performing, right? So the right to information often gets incorporated. Founder terms I've talked about, closing conditions I've talked about. Uh, Preemption rights or veto rights, right? So again, I've talked about it. So if there is a change of business, that means you're raising a subsequent round, uh, the initial investors or the existing investors may want to have a say, right? And that's built into the agreement, right? Um, and of course, you know, fundraising uh, will result in a change in the capital structure. So they also have a say, right? So, um, and uh, there, there could be affirmative rights relating to size of uh, investments in capital expenditure and things like that, right? And I'll talk a little bit about affirmative rights later on, right? Now, the question is, given that invest, you may be granting such veto to the investors, uh, the big question for entrepreneurs is, how are you going to manage this veto? And it makes sense for you to have a discussion, right? Especially when you are raising money from multiple angels, right? Let's say you're raising money from 20 angel investors. How do you manage 20 people? Okay, so often, um, you know, uh, there is an agreement on a mechanism and the mechanism may be that uh, uh, basically you need the approval of the two board observers, for example, right? And, and you leave it to the investors on how they manage amongst themselves, right? So it kind of helps uh, when you raise uh, from say a Karetsu where um, you know, uh, one of the members will manage the other members uh, and therefore it becomes easier for the company uh, to manage issues around uh, veto rights that the investors will have. Okay. I mean, you know, officially you may need the approval of a lot, but you may need to figure out how you're going to manage uh, a large number of investors, right? And this is therefore important for early stage investors. And one of the ways to do it is regular communication. Um, generally, angels are very forgiving. Uh, uh, if people uh, communicate regularly and you know tell them of problems early, right? Because we know that we are making early stage investments, and problems are a nature of the beast. Okay, so um, so you need to build that relationship with your investors, right? And that's an important uh, aspect of. Uh, angel investing and early stage investing. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, so let's talk about um, how to do evaluation. Okay, now how do people value businesses, right? And typically they value businesses by comparing to other similar businesses. Now, the problem for startups is there's almost no comparable public valuation or public information. Okay. Uh, and therefore, we have this huge difficulty about uh, finding comparable value, right? At the end of the day, if you are raising money, right, you have to go and tell the potential investor that I'm raising at this valuation. And the question that the investor will ask is, how did you arrive at that valuation? Okay. And the problem is, what do you say, right? There's no business like you, you're an innovative product. Um, there's no other public company. And anyway, public companies are huge, you're a startup. How do you compare to public information? Okay. Now, various agencies like, like, um, uh, uh, th th there are all kinds of uh, um, valuation portals like PitchBook. Um, there are also a couple of uh, uh, companies in, in India that have attempted to provide some public information about startup deals. Okay. And the way they go about gaining such public uh, information is by uh, uh, basically scouring the web, right? So they go through whatever information about any startups, whether it's a fintech startup, you know, they, 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 they search the web to see if there are any uh, information, any public information, and based on which they try and build uh, some uh, data about uh, value of startups, okay? Now, the problem with a lot of this is the information is often not sufficiently accurate. Okay, so the most accurate that I've seen is a Singapore company called Value Cap. And the reason they are a lot more accurate is because they actually get information from official sources like the Registrar of Companies. Okay, and, and because they have to get information from Registrar of Companies and they do it automatically, uh, they have actually started with the Registrar in Singapore, right? And they've not expanded much beyond. And because a lot of South Asian companies worth their salt actually incorporate in Singapore, uh, we are therefore able to get some information about valuations in Vietnam, Indonesia, and, and other Southeast Asian countries. Okay. Now they have not expanded to India. And, and of course uh, the problem with the registry is in India is a lot of that is manual, but at some stage, you know, they may be prepared to, uh, go and get that information manually and upload it and build some public valuation information on how the value has changed from early stage to the next stage to the subsequent stage. Okay. So there are people who are trying to build such databases. Um, but as I said, it's an imperfect world. Uh, you don't get a great information. Um, the second way to do evaluation is by looking at exits. So if you look at a business and, and if it's a deep tech company or a fintech company, you can let, look at what exit valuations are, okay? And what is it as a multiple of revenue at a multiple, uh, no point looking at profits, right? When you're early stage, you don't even know what the profits are. And, but the problem is again, such information, uh, unless uh, it is uh, collated accurately as, as value cap is trying to do in Singapore, um, it's only as good as what people have posted on the web. Okay. So, which is the reason for my, my title here, right? It's an imperfect world, right? So startup valuations are extremely difficult. Now, those of y'all who are finance trained may have heard uh, what's called a discounted cash flow. So you do a projection for the next five years and discount it to today on a based on discount rate and say that is your value, right? If any company comes to me and says, uh, my discounted cash flow value is X, I will say goodbye. I don't want a further discussion because the problem with discounted cash flow is it fully values the business and therefore there is no upside for the investor. 
right? And the problem for early stage companies, especially many of the investments that we do, even before uh, they have any substantial revenue is how do you project the next five years, right? You can be extremely optimistic. Uh, is that real? Will it happen? Uh, and, and therefore discounted cash flow may work for mature businesses. It often does not work for early stage businesses. Okay. So ideally we want comparable deal valuation, right? In some ways we have built rule of thumbs to sort of say, if it's a services business, you know, and it's very early, the valuation needs to be between three and 5 million. And how, have we built such comparable data? It's because we've been in this business for five, six years and we have invested at certain value uh, and subsequent events have told us whether it's too high or too low, depending on the returns uh, that has accrued to us, right? So, um, so many of us uh, who are experienced in angel investing have developed this comparable deal valuations, okay? Um, and, and Often, as I said, you know, services business tend to be lower um, um, businesses with deep technology, uh, maybe even patents tend to be higher, right? And, and this is a, a rule of thumb that we have developed over time, right? And basically when people come to a pre-money value, right? And I remember there was a question early on, right? An angel investor is looking for, okay, in five years or seven years when this company exits, is there a potential for me to get a 10X exit value? Okay, um, is usually the way they work backwards to see if the initial valuation is reasonable, right? But often it is deferred back to what I would call comparable deal valuations, right? We've had companies uh, in the FinTech space come to us and said, we are valued as US 13 million, you know, and we don't have any revenue, but we are talking to some major banks. Um, usually my response is goodbye, come back to us when you actually have built a track record, right? Because something like a 13 million US dollar value uh, when you don't even have revenue is a non-starter, okay? So let me go to the next slide and sort of uh, tell you how we have built rules of thumbs over time, okay? So the valuation is an art, not a science. Um, um, one of the ways in which we started looking at value uh, when we first started uh, investing is we looked at US data. The and the reason we looked at US data is because there wasn't sufficient Indian data at that time. And even now, I'm not sure there's sufficiently well compiled uh, India data. Maybe there is, but I'm just not aware. So when we started about five years ago, what we found out is that on av the average valuation for startups in the US is about 4.7 million, uh, right, pre-money. And we have seen investments that goes as low as 2 million and as high as, um, um, you know, six, seven million, depending on um, what they do, right? What kind of business they are, what kind of intellectual property they own, um, what uh, future potential that they have, right? So for example, if it's in pharmaceuticals, you know that the exits tend to be extremely attractive multiples and therefore they tend to be on the higher end. While if it's uh, largely a app-based or a uh, e-commerce based business, it tends to be on the lower end, okay? So we've often measured it against this 4.7 million number uh, and then, of course, you know, if the company is in India, you need to make an adjustment for purchase price parity, right? Because India is about the most competitive market that we know, right? And we know that uh, revenue growth doesn't take place the way it, it happens in the United States, right? So, you know, uh, the comparable value to 4.7, maybe one and a half to two million US is probably the equivalent that we are thinking about uh, when we look at companies in India. Right, and and that's kind of true. Um, we have done, um, we've done some deals at uh, very low valuation, but often that's not recommended because uh, what happens is that founders lose interest rather quickly. Um, so the lowest where the founders have uh, 
been happy to plow along, I think is a three crore valuation and that was a services business. But if it's a product business in the IoT space, pre-money tends to be around the five to uh, seven crore range. And then if there is a lot more technology involved, it tends to be in the 12 to 16 crore range, right? That is, this is what we call the first race, right? The first uh, external investors or the angel investors, that's the kind of value that we have seen uh, over the last five years, okay? So the, the warning for you as, as an entrepreneur raising value, if you have a very high valuation expectations, right? It is much harder for you to win over the angel investor, right? And if your valuation expectation, you know, the example I gave, you know, somebody came to speak to us and said, they're worth 13 million US, I am immediately put off and I don't even want to have a further conversation with that person, okay? So it is important how you pitch this and, and you understand, um, not just, uh, you don't think about it just from your perspective, you also need to think about it from the perspective of the angel investor, right? Which is, um, which is really this whole series, right? I mean, the, the thing is um, an angel investor doesn't get successful exits on all their investments, right? A third of the investments, they almost write off. A third, they get a middling return. And it's the third that performs and gives them the 5X or 10X return, right? So that's how an angel investor uh, looks at the portfolio, right? They evaluate every portfolio to see does this company have the potential of giving me a 10x return, right? Which is why some of those calculations that I took you through are important for you to understand. Okay, the next slide. Okay. So usually at an early stage, we often do a convertible, right? Or a CCPS with a valuation cap, right? And we think that's better to equity because, you know, you could be a little bit flexible about the valuation cap. But given the examples I took through, if the valuation caps is sophisticated, right? We may need to, uh, you know, we, we may have to do a conditional a valuation that's conditional on revenue, right? Because it can get very complicated, right? Sometimes people get really tired about the debate on valuation. Now, um, sophisticated startups uh, reduce the valuation cap if, uh, for example, their rollout plan changes. Um, but to be honest, I've only seen one company do this and it was a US company, right? Uh, basically what it means is that the fundraising is much slower, right? In which case, their growth is much slower, right? So they compensate the early investors by reducing their valuation cap, okay? Because otherwise, you know, uh, anti-dilution provisions might also be triggered. So this is a warning for you. Remember that experienced angel investors know that a third of their investments is a write-off, right? So they will, they will look at valuations with a fair amount of caution. Okay, next slide. Kapil, uh, Priya, okay. Now, there are two documents that you need to be aware of. Usually, um, you know, we covered uh, due diligence uh, in the session last week. And usually at the end of the due diligence, um, there is a document that is signed. It's called a term sheet. Uh, a term sheet is uh, non-binding. That means legally it cannot be enforced. But all parties, whether it's the founders, the entrepreneurs, or the angel investors, uh, normally respect this, okay? Now, the stage where term sheets become a game is when you become a bigger company and you're doing a series B or a series C, or, or, or you're a large company and, and you're looking at exit, um, people are less reluctant to give you a term sheet because they're always worried that you're going to take the term sheet and shop it around to get a better deal, okay? So, but those are later stage, as an early stage, um, you know, raising your first round or your second round, uh, everybody would respect the term sheet, right? So normally there's a non-binding agreement um, and, and basically the term sheet will cover things like valuation, uh, valuation caps, the instrument of investment, are you doing a CCPS? Are you doing straight equity that is linked to revenue? 
uh, liquidation preference that I talked about. I've talked about anti-dilution protection, affirmative rights. These are the veto rights, right? If for a change of uh, capital structure, how are you going to use the money? Uh, and of course, all term sheets have a governing law, right? And if you do a deal in India, typically the governing law is Indian law, right? If you do a deal in the US, it's US law or whichever the country in which the company is uh, domiciled. Now, we try and get most of the terms um, agreed at the term sheet stage, because that makes the lawyer's life who is drafting the definitive agreements a lot easier, okay? So once the term sheet is kind of signed or, or is about to be signed, usually you will start engaging a lawyer to draft the definitive agreements. So I think my next slide is on definitive agreements, uh, uh, Priya. Right. So what is the definitive agreement? Okay. Basically, it, it fleshes out the term sheet, right, which is my last point. Okay. And it is basically a, a share purchase agreement, meaning that the new investors are buying new shares, whether it's convertibles um, or pref shares, convertible pref shares or equity or whatever it is. So there's a share purchase agreement. And there is also the investor rights, investor or shareholder rights agreement, right? As I said, uh, there are all kinds of deal terms, you know, whether there is co-sale rights, uh, tag along rights, uh, drag along rights, uh, rights of first refusal, right? So all of these terms are often put into a single document instead of having multiple documents, one share purchase agreement, another shareholder rights document, right? So instead of all of it, the definitive agreement is a single document but incorporates all the deal terms that is largely discussed and fleshed out in the term sheet um, and, and that's drafted into an agreement, right? So typically, as soon as they sign the agreement, the money is released to you um, and, and you have achieved deal close, okay? So that's what happens. And, and usually, uh, definitive agreements uh, is done by lawyers. Um, and one of the ways in which you can, um, uh, you know, you, you can win uh, investors' uh, comfort is if you use a lawyer that they have used before and they're familiar with, right? Because nobody has time to go and look at all the, all the terms and clauses in the agreement, right? So when I look at a definitive agreement, I only look out for the few key things, right? Whether the valuation has been correctly picked up, um, whether there is some documentation around affirmative rights, there's documentation around uh, tag along, drag along rights, um, what the liquidation preference is, and just to make sure that that's as agreed at the term sheet, right? But otherwise, nobody wants to read this full legal document, right? So if you use a lawyer that the um, investors are comfortable with, you know, the investors won't give you a hard time and, and won't you know, try to, you know, try and debate every word in an agreement because you really don't have the time for that. Okay. So it makes sense. And, and, and there are a few lawyers in, in Chennai who are commonly used for startup agreements, right? And that's just a way of gaining confidence and getting the deal done quickly. Okay. So today was a big session. So um, time for Q&A. Okay, let me try and get to your chat. Okay, let me see. How do we arrive at pre-money valuation? Right, okay, so I've, I've talked about this. There is no standard method. Um, it, it is a bit of a rule of thumb that we have developed based on comparable transactions. Someone said I couldn't attend the last session. I think Ty is doing a recording um, and they will be sharing it with you. Who sets the valuation gap? Arun, um, it's negotiated basically between uh, the entrepreneur and the investor, right? And, and we, okay, anyway, SVK has answered that. Yep, this discussion between investor and entrepreneur. And it's often related to the type of business. Uh, 
are this exit valuation founders get? Uh, exit valuation is the price at which the business eventually gets sold. Okay. So basically based on an exit value, you kind of work backwards to say how long to an exit, what kind of multiple therefore we expect, right? So the, the valuation at the time that you raise money is a, you know, is, is a fraction of the exit value, depending on the kind of, uh, multiple that the investor wants to achieve or the investor expects to achieve or is common in early stage investments, right? So that's how exit valuations are taken into account. At what events are valuation done? Um, every time you have a fundraise, you have a valuation discussion, right? Um, many of some of the companies we've invested in have probably uh, had maybe three or four rounds of fundraise. Um, you know, when we first invested, um, then they often do a pre-series A because, um, you know, uh, especially deep tech companies, it takes them quite a bit of time. Or oh, actually what we have found in, in India, getting to a, a reasonable revenue, uh, especially with the, com with the companies that we have invested in, it takes time, right? So often they need to do a bridge in between. Uh, they're often not big enough to do a series A. So we do a pre-series A, then they do a series A and some of them now are doing a series B or a series A plus if you like. Um, and then there are other situations when they may want to raise money. Um, some of the issues of COVID was that they affected businesses. They are continuing to hold on to the infrastructure but they have no revenue for a few months. Right, so some of them have also raised cash under those circumstances so that they got enough money to come back alive and, and fight the market once uh, it's opened up and, and many of the companies are now uh, going up. So you, you need a valuation at each of these circumstances um, and which is why you need to understand how this plays out, right? Um, because if you start your business at such a high valuation at the beginning, you almost definitely down the road may have a down round and that doesn't bode well for any of the invested parties. Okay. So, which is why you need to be sensible about how you set valuations at every stage. Right. Okay. So someone is asking to unmute. So let's go with the first person. Sarumadi. Yep, you're unmuted. Yeah, one yes, unmuted unmuted. Hello, sir. Good evening. This is Sarumadi. Yeah, tell me. Uh, uh, sir, I have uh, two questions for you. One okay. is that we are a startup in healthcare space. We are raising, uh, you know, money through friends and families as a seed capital. In okay. this case, like my very close friends and family are, you know, trying to do a very minimal amount as a seed capital. So in this case, do we need to go for a valuation if it's a must? No, it's uh, between friends and family is, um, you do a friendly dealer, right? Okay. It's, it's too early to get sophisticated, right? Okay. So if you come, I think, um, I think it was my session two, right? Um, see, valuation becomes important when you're raising money from outsiders, right? When you're raising money from friends and family, you can be a lot more flexible. Okay. Right, no point to get no point getting serious about valuations at that stage. Okay, in this case, should we have to give them equity or CCPS? What is preferred? Like actually, I'm a bit confused. Very, I'm not very, very early, clear. yeah, very early. Don't don't get into CCPS because then you have this conversion formulas and all that kind of thing. Agree on straight equity, right? So okay, so maybe if you started your company at uh, ten rupee per share. Mm -hmm. You might ask them to invest at you know fifty rupees a share or a hundred rupees per share. You know, don't don't get into anything sophisticated at that stage. Okay, okay. So mm -hmm. how how do we so how do we evaluate sir? Like you know, what is the base value? Because you told about comparable or you know or deal valuation something like that. Like under what okay, kind I, of I I will almost never break my head at the friends and family round. It's really okay. a friendly deal. Okay. Right. Um, break your head when it comes to taking money from outsiders. Right. 
So you see, basically the principle is this, right? They are investors, okay? So you 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 know you you cannot dilute too much before you've gone out, okay? Mm -hmm. So as a founder, you probably shouldn't dilute more than uh, 10, 15 percent at your family round. Maybe not even more than 10 percent, okay, of the company, because it's important that the founders hold on to a, a, a sizable chunk when you go and do your angel round. Because you know, again, you know, based on my earlier sessions, you will keep diluting. You know, Series A you will dilute, Series B will dilute, right? So um, you know, we need to make sure that the founders have enough, right? So an investor would say, well, have, have the founders have enough skin in the game to perform, right? So okay. your early rounds, your friend family rounds, you know, you shouldn't dilute too much is basically the principle. Uh, fine, sir. Thank you. And the second question is, uh, we are, uh, you know, got a kind of placement in the incubation cell, uh, yeah. where they say is uh, they would give us a seed fund for which we need to pledge 3% of our equity. So that's, in this case- That's normal. That's normal. I think a lot of the deep tech companies we've done from IIT Madras uh, because of the incubation help or, or, or the support that they got of IIT, they typically give up 6%. So that's normal. 3 to 6% is in the range. Um, pledging or giving? Yeah, I don't know what you mean by pledge. I, I assume that uh, they have to... We need to give the 3% of the share of our company yeah, is, to the incubation. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's normal. That's normal. Oh. That's normal, right? Because they are giving you value for not, uh, and you don't have to pay for it, right? So it, the important question for you is you should evaluate the incubator, mm -hmm. find out what kind of track record that they have, mm -hmm. right? Whether they are good, they're actually going to support you. If, mm -hmm. if you get good support, you know, giving up 3% is nothing. Uh, as I said, a lot of our IIT companies, uh, we've, uh, we've seen them give up 6% to IIT. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you spoke about the IRR on that, you know, two compar comparative calculations, A and B, uh, yeah. which were like, you know, 90, 20 or something like that. What is the minimum IRR a startup should agree with because the maximum is fine as a company performs? What is it, you know, bare minimum that IRR we should commit to give even no, if our company no, no, doesn't? You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't. You cannot commit. You, cannot you commit don't company. commit to an IRR. An okay. IRR is how the investor calculates his or her return, okay? Okay. Um, IRR is, 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 um, is financial terminology in itself. That's how the entire fund management industry works and it stands for internal rate of return, okay? Okay. There's a huge calculation around it, but you can use a Excel formula and work it out. So the easiest thing for me to tell you to do is just Google IRR and you will get a whole horde of Host of literature, right? Basically, what it means is, you know, if if I put money in a in a bank, and mm -hmm. I roll it every year, right? I might get, I don't know what bank rates today is, probably about five percent, right? So if I put a hundred thousand now, it's one hundred five thousand at the end of the year, and then you put one hundred five thousand, I get hundred and uh, uh, six thousand five hundred, maybe at the end of second year, right? So that the IRR there was five percent, okay. So it's the compounded rate of return. Okay. So IRR works backward based on their uh, invested value and the exit value and, and apply it over the period of time. What is the compounded return that the investor gets, right? The higher the IRR, the better the investor did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, next. Uh, what does term sheet... <clears throat> Jawahar, I didn't, didn't understand your question. Uh, what does term sheet? Who does the term sheet? Okay. It, it's mutually agreed. Uh, there are standard templates for a term sheet. Just Google term sheet, you will get something. Um, and, and typically the term sheet uh, should have all the items that I've listed in my slides. Uh, and if you remember uh, my presentation last week, uh, I had given a link to the uh, Kerisu Forum's uh, due diligence handbook. So there are examples of term sheets and definitive agreements in that huge stack, right? So if you just click the link, um, you know, there are samples out there. Uh, of course, over time, um, you know, these things get improved. Um, 
you know, and, and therefore uh, in, in Keritsu, because we've done so many deals, we can just pull out one of the earlier term sheets and then change the terms, okay? Um, so basically the, the terms are mutually uh, arrived at, right? But there are pretty standard documentation for these. Jawhar, what are my options if I would like to buy back the investor shares, right? So this is redemption and keep the company with myself without selling out. I think I've answered this question earlier, Jawahar, one of the earlier sessions. Um, you know, redemptions are not common for early stage businesses because what is the likelihood that you do, you do so phenomenally well that you can buy out your investors at a very attractive price? Right, so that's a question. Um, if you really want to do it, um, I think it's a conversation in itself. The answer is it's not easy, right? But if you really want to do it, then you build something into the definitive agreement, right? You need to build a redemption clause in your term sheet, which then gets translated into a definitive agreement. And the way you can do it is agree on a fixed uh, a return. Um, right, and therefore you can say that, okay, after three years, you have a right to buy back and the and you will give the investors an IRR of 30% or 35% or something like that, right? That you would need to negotiate, right? That's the way you build it into an agreement. How the valuation discount is uh, arrived at? It is often negotiated. Um, it is uh, often a reference to uh, time and risk, right? So let's say you agree to a 20% decon less than two years. I mean, 20% not really attractive, right? It's 10% uh, per year, right? And if you do an IRR, you know, it's probably 9%, right? Now, and, and that's not much above uh, putting money in deposit, right? So basically somebody is looking for a uh, higher return than that. And which is why uh, there is often what's a valuation cap, right? In the hope that uh, actually you are able to uh, raise a subsequent round at a much higher value so that the investor can get a much higher IRR than say 9% or 10%, okay? So, so there is a, a, a science and, and therefore the link of the valuation discount is, is based on the return uh, equation that the investor is looking at, right? Which is the reason for going through, you know, all the calculations that I went through in the session today. Because th th there's a reason why we go through that, right? And, and while when you discuss valuations, you may not actually do those calculations, but it is in the back of a, a good investor, right? They know this, they know this intuitively, right? Because they've done enough deals. But generally, I've seen discounts in the range of 20% or 30%, right? And, and the way that the investor actually makes money is on the valuation cap, right? That's why there is often a debate about what is a sensible valuation cap, right? Because of all the implications I talked about. Okay, I've covered all the questions. Any other questions? We still have uh, almost 25 minutes left. Do we? Oh, 25 minutes, sir. No, we finished, is it? We finished we, the I, session. <laughs> oh, I've, I've overrun. Okay, sorry. I, uh -huh. I was just wondering what's happening to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, we've gone over. I, I knew think... today would be a heavy session. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, you know, this brings everything we have uh, discussed mm -hmm. together, right? Because this is the close of your deal. Yeah. Uh, Guys, if you have any questions, you just note it down and we can answer it later. Tai can yeah. arrange the follow-up session. Yeah, so I've uh, recommended to Tai and, and I think Akila has agreed to do a, a, a panel discussion session with me, SVK and Shrikant. So if you still have questions after going through all the six sessions, including the recordings, uh, recordings of it, we can, um, you know, we can actually have a, a, a Q&A and, and try and address all of it. But you know, before you come to a, a, a Q and A, you really need to, you know, do some work on your own, right? I've given a lot of reference material. Some of it, um, you know, we didn't have time to go through in in these sessions, but they are all very useful. So you should at least flip through all of those documents 
maybe even watch some of the videos. Um, you know, just just Google some of these terminologies, and you'll get a wealth of information out there, right? And the purpose of this talk is to sensitize you to the um, to how complex this business can be, right? So that you kind of know what you're getting into, right? But if you really want to know more, understand more, um, there's so much information out there, right? And some references I've, I've already given. Okay, Priya, you want to do a close? Uh, yes, sir. thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful session today, as well as uh, the uh, in lot of informa informative and uh, useful uh, sessions, the previous five sessions as well. And uh, thank you for explaining what are the uh, deep, the various deal terms and what about uh, valuation and discounts. And that too with an example, uh, which I'm sure, um, uh, you know, the participants have understood it better because of that. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, explaining the various uh, uh, methodologies of valuation and also covering the different uh, transaction documents, of course. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, not only did uh, this session be well, was very informative, we had the previous five sessions as well. Uh, the proof is uh, the various good feedbacks we have been receiving from the participants and them being very consistent uh, in all your sessions. You, I'm sure you know almost all of them uh, by names in these uh, after these uh, six sessions uh, so we would like to thank you very much for that and uh, svk sir and shikan sir for their support in clarifying doubts when and where, wherever required and uh, you know being patient with the participants and all three of you for being patient with the participants and answering each and every uh, doubt and uh, uh, you know clar clarifying it to them uh, so thank you so much and uh, uh, definitely a big thank you to kirit forum and uh, you three for extending your support and agreeing to do this series with uh, uh, us and uh, our gratitude for showing your interest in you know uh, having a separate uh, Q&A session for the inquisitive audience we have uh, here for this uh, series. Um, thank you so much and we look forward to having the Q&A, uh, exclusive Q&A session uh, in this. So uh, like, he, like uh, Subra sir mentioned that we will be sharing the recording as well as the uh, various uh, presentations that were um, you know, used for the for all these six sessions, and uh, uh, you can have a look at it, and we'll have an exclusive exclusive Q and A session post that. Um, thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you, SVK, sir. Uh, last but not the least, I would like to thank the uh, participants who were who have been consistent and you know part of our all five uh, six sessions in uh, how to be investment uh, ready series. Uh, so before we sign off, I just have a small announcement to make on uh, uh, the Taikon Chennai, which is the uh, Tai Chennai's annual um, uh, conference uh, uh, that is planned this year virtually from October 5th to 10th. Uh, with Tamil and uh, English uh, speaker sessions uh, from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, every day from Monday to Friday and uh, two masterclass sessions on uh, the Saturday. Uh, the uh, uh, We have also planned the virtual Thai Sunday this time and the bookings for the um, Thai Sunday stall as well as the conference is open now and uh, please feel free to get in touch with Saurav. Uh, he'll be sharing his credentials in the chat and uh, once again thank you so much and uh, look forward to meeting you all again for the exclusive Q&A session and we'll keep you posted on the uh, details of that session. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone.